Uh, as we turn to part two of the discussion on traceability, we're going to take a closer look at deforestation and conversion-free soy. With that, I get to introduce our next speakers, Jason Berryhill, the co-founder of Whole Chain, Dr. Patricia Sugi, uh, an ESG manager at CJ Selecta, Catherine Breyer, the global marketing director for Biomar, and Joseph Selwood, the co-founder of Rever or Revere. And I've, oh, I've messed this up a million times. You say Hever, it's R's are like H's in Portuguese, okay. but Rever is fun. Rever, thank you. And, and Vivian Tai, who leads Innovation, Circular Economy, Sustainability, and Supply Chain Resilience at GS1. Round of applause, everyone. <laughs> Bigger. Okay. Catherine, I'm hoping you can help explain um, that you know not everyone might be aware of the link between aquaculture and deforestation, and and I'm wondering how we make this connection. Okay, so um, aqua feeds um, is how we get to this point. Traditionally, we had aqua feeds, which was primarily what we call marine resources, which are the fish from the sea. But as the ocean started to get depleted we needed to find nutrients from another source. And what we do when we make aquafeeds is that we actually source raw materials, but nutrients, we need protein, we need omega-3s, we need omega-6s, and they can come from multiple areas. So in order to be more sustainable, we stop taking a lot of the fish from the ocean to right. feed to fish, to farm fish, and we substituted that with other protein sources, and one of them was soy. So from, from there, we were in a situation that, okay, we're sourcing soy to feed. So we're sourcing a product that otherwise can be directly consumed by humans. And we needed to make sure that that soy was done in the right way. Or what we're doing here is just problem shifting. We move from saving the, the fish in the sea to uh, being part of... Uh, the Amazon being burnt down. Sure, sure. So for um, the farmers, it was really important that we didn't do this problem shifting. So what we did was say, okay, we need to be have a supply chain that is free um, from deforestation and conversion uh, so that we can guarantee that we're not actually problem shifting in, in, in this sense. So it was really led by the salmon farmers um, with this because they were driven to do... Uh, do their feed in a better way because people don't really understand. They, they look at the impacts um, on, our, on our food system and when you're feeding an animal, um, uh, whatever you're feeding them, you inherit the impacts from down the value chain. So you can't just look at the impacts on farm. Right. And the truth is that the environmental impacts of um, seafood farming is 80% coming from the feed. So it's important to get the feed right. And that's why it's important that the, why we initiated this project right, right. On, on ensuring that there was a sustainable um, route to market. And again, connecting those dots in a way that we haven't been able to, I think it, it's so important. Vivian, if I can turn to you now, when we're talking about traceability and transparency, what kind of re requirements are currently in place? And, how do we ensure that there is none of that greenwashing that we talked about in the last panel? Yeah, so I think that the primary thing to keep in mind when you're talking about transparency and traceability is that having accountability yeah. starts with common data sharing standards. So I am uh, the, <laughs> the, the de facto standards nerd here, but I'm also um, really passionate about sustainability, but when we think about the greenwashing practices out there, a lot of it is because there's unsubstantiated claims. So how you start by addressing that is by having um, common language shared between trading partners so that you guys, I mean, everyone participating can be accountable um, and, and speak a common language. And so that, that GS1 traceability, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So actually, GS1 standards, uh, you all are probably interacting with GS1 on a daily basis without knowing it. Every time you go uh, beep at checkout, you are actually interacting with GS1 standards. We are known as the barcode people. But it actually goes far, far upstream, and it's much 
more wide-ranging than just barcodes. So we have something um, called EPCIS, which is um, really essential for critical event tracking. And when I say events, I mean like things that happen along the supply chain. And why this is important is because when you have um, things that occur <laughs> along the supply chain that need accountability for, you need that common language to, to yeah. start talking about these events. Yeah. And one of the ways in which our standards are being used uh, in a really significant way for food is through the Food Modernization, uh, Food Safety Modernization Act. So that, that's one regulation that's really um, putting the pressure on a lot of yeah. producers, actually. Yeah, thank you for all that. Jason, for all of this to work, we need data, and we need really good data. And, and I'm wonder, wondering what role the data collection plays in supporting standardization and making sure that everyone's on this level playing field. Yeah, I mean, in many ways, it's, it's actually the other way around in some ways, that, that the standardization supports the data collection. So I'll give you an example. Um, I mean, if I were to send you an email and I have a Gmail, I don't first ask, do you use Gmail? <laughs> because I can just send you an email and if you use Hotmail or whatever else, like you can receive that. That's not true of many supply chain data systems. Right? If one system speaks a different language from the other, then what you have is data silos, and that data can't pass along through sometimes very complex supply chains, which is true of feed, their ingredients, the connection then to aquaculture, and all the way to store. You're talking about a lot of complexity. So the nice thing about standards is it creates that layer of common language throughout the supply chain. That's extremely important in this particular circumstance yeah. because if you can imagine uh, globally, Aquaculture feed takes up only one half of 1% of all soy, right? So it's a huge market. If you were to take an average grocery store, turn it upside down, about half of what's going to hit the ceiling had something to do with the soy industry, right? This huge market, if Biomar wants to make an ask of that supply chain, they don't have a lot of leverage, right? Because it's a small percentage. They're not buying as much. But if, if different players in these industries can start to coordinate around standards like GS1, what happens is they're all making substantially the same ask, yeah. which means we're going to collect more data in those supply yeah. chains, which is very critical. It's so, it's, it's so simple, but yet so complex. I mean, you always explain it really well for me. Catherine, what, what Jason is sort of identifying is that you need to work with all of these different players. Can you talk about how your work with, you know, with partners and collaborators sort of helps that, that system move forward? Yeah. Yeah, so in, for, in order for us to make the first um, uh, deforestation conversion free supply chain, we actually needed to ensure that the, the two players in, this was particularly for an, on a project for Brazil, we had two players come on board um, and we actually needed them to have all their soy that they produce as deforestation conversion free because we could not guarantee right, right. the supply chain. Um, because of the batches, they, there wasn't a barcoding and there wasn't traceability in, in place. So we said, okay, we, you, we can't guarantee whether, where, whether that soybean came from that father, farmer or another farmer and they all get then dumped into the same silos. We couldn't guarantee that. So what we needed to do initially was to say, okay, um, as a collective industry, not just Biomar, but the other two major um, feed, uh, aquaculture feed players came in and demanded that we're not going to buy from you unless you convert yeah. your entire supply chain. Yeah. Well, that was fantastic. We did that in 2020, and now we have guaranteed that that shrimp that's running around here is deforestation conversion free. We can, we can guarantee that. Um, but it's not a model for scaling up. And as, as Jason said, we're 0.4% um, of the entire soy market sure. in the world. Um, so it's not going to work. We're gonna, we need these standards and we need this technology in place in order to scale it to cattle, um, to chicken and to other yeah. players. Vivian, what opportunities do you see for GS1 standards to continue that work, whether we're talking about deforestation-free soy or something else? So I... First of all, I think the FISMA 204 Act that I had previously touched on, that's actually a really significant mm -hmm. opportunity across multiple commodities and foods. Um, I think that actually sets a great precedence for deforestation-free um, products because uh, there's actually a, um, an act, I think it was, it's called like 
like Forest Act, yeah, Forest Act 2023, it was introduced to um, the Senate, and it, it, I mean, it's it's a long process regulation-wise, but sure. that is promising um, in hopes that we will be able to have more regulation around this because if we re um, sometimes if we just rely on um, you know grassroots efforts it's not enough of an yeah. incentive, right? So we really would love to see more of uh, a more robust, um, you know, regulatory environment for this. But in, sorry, in no, <laughs> getting no, back please. to your, your actual question on like what other opportunities. Yeah. Um, I think that traceability is something that is table stakes. It's something that we cannot get away from uh, when we think about sustainability again. And it's, if you don't have standards, if you don't have a common language to communicate, if you don't have unique identification across your supply chains, um, then it, will, it won't work. Thank you so much for that, Catherine. I was just gonna jump in. Regulation is definitely not enough. One of the situations we discovered was that um, actually Brazil has fantastic deep regulations on, on protecting the Amazon, but they found loopholes in the system. What we discovered um, when we were going out there doing our audits is that they were co um, converting um, rainforests into cattle uh, ranging and they would allow it to be grazed and then after uh, the grazing it was said to be grazed out, then they were coming and putting soy fields down mm. on there. So that was, it is conversion, you know, it's just, but that was legal. So we found out that it's not good enough just to have those um, standards in, in place and the regulatory. We actually need to have the full traceability to know what right. things are happen, happening out there. Right. That's why it's so vital to get this data, knowing exactly what farm and then what has that farm been through? What was it before it was a soy field? You know, when did it go back to being a rainforest? And should it actually be converted back to rainforest? Absolutely, thank you for that. Joe, I want to bring you into the conversation, and I'm wondering where do you see the opportunities in aquaculture supply chains to encourage greater adoption of best practices? Best practices of traceability and mm -hmm. sustainability? Yes. Um, yeah, like, like we said, we're going to start a pilot right now, uh, you know, getting that information for grains, for feed. Uh, and being able to verify that information, I think, opens huge opportunity. You know, if you look at kind of uh, the, the amounts of protein that we need, it's, it's massive. No? Um, but a lot of that is, is available. Uh, we just need to verify that this protein is coming from areas that have not sure. been deforested. Sure. By, by doing that as quickly as possible, then we can really concentrate efforts on hot spots, right, on, on right. where the attention really needs to be paid. Uh, and so we're starting a very you know, innovative application right now together with everyone here. And, and Patricia, who's from CG Select that couldn't make it, she had an illness in the family, um, where we're going to be doing exactly that. So we're going to be working with them and those systems in order to verify the traceability data uh, according to, to GS1 so very quickly we can get large amounts um, verified. Jason, please. Yeah, and just to jump in on that, traceability is most important in particularly sensitive areas because imagine you're a farmer uh, in Monte Grosso or in some of these areas where a lot of the deforestation is happening. Um, if all of the market just starts to pull out of that area because of risk, then what happens is we really leave the, the worst issues in our world right now in terms of the environment to the lowest bidder, yeah. which is probably not a great place for us all to be. So what we really need to have is traceability to particular farms so that brands can say, we're buying from those farms. We're not having to just avoid the problem altogether because we have no idea which farms. We can say these 147 farms we have verified as compliant and we're getting traceability data and therefore we can support those sensitive areas as opposed to completely backing away and making the price go down further, which again incentivizes the farms to have this awful choice right. of am I going to feed my kids or am I going to create more farmland, right? Because prices go down. And so we have to have traceability to yeah. encourage those best practices. Joe, coming back to you, that, that, that incentive structure is so key for this, right? And so, you know, we can either, you know, uh, have what, what Jason described as, you know, low prices so people, you know, are forced to destroy the land. They don't want to. They want to keep it. 
uh, what, what kinds of, of incentives are really going to help producers the most? Yeah, I mean, like you said before, these aren't bad people, you know, no. they're just incentivized to do the wrong thing. Um, and that's the only way, you know, they can make a living and, and feed their family, et cetera. So, yeah, we have to have different incentives in place. Uh, so the right people do the right thing at the right time. Um, and, you know, for decades, we, have, we don't know who they, who they are, sure. right? Um, and now with, you know, traceability and these applications for the first time, uh, even people, you know, way downstream can, can know who they are. And so we're working right now in kind of having a basket of incentives for those people that are, are doing the right thing so they can, they have an alternative um, in, in order to improve their lives yeah. uh, that's not just selling the cattle or selling Right, sort. and that basket of incentives is like this virtuous cycle that just keeps continuing because, you know, their neighbors see, you know, their, their children see it. It all just keeps continuing as long as that's in place. Yeah, it's, it's the same everywhere. Everybody wants to do well, improve, and right. do better. Um, and so, yeah, that basket will include probably a lot of different benefits, um, but the, the end is a positive impact in those people's lives that are in that place. And really, that's the best chance that we have of saving these areas. Yeah. You know, because, you know, a lot of, like, illegal production is on federal land because there's just no way to really police it, et cetera. Um, so if you incentivize, you know, private landowners to do the right thing, you know, that's the best mechanism you're going to have in place to really save these places. Yeah, it's so exciting. Thank you for sharing all that. So th this is for all of you. We, we talked about traceability uh, in, the, in the chocolate industry, and we talked about working with direct competitors to drive systems change more quickly. And we've also talked about that on this panel. How can we encourage, because it's very difficult, it's very easy for us to say and tell the audience here and, and watching online, collaborate more, have, you know, have bigger and better partnerships, but it's really hard to do in practice. So Vivian, I'm hoping you can sort of maybe talk about this first. Yeah, so from a, like selfishly, talking about standards, actually standards are pre-competitive. It gets you to the place where you can keep, compete on things that actually matter. So instead of competing on like the, the type of, I don't know, gas that you're running on in a car, you're actually competing on the make of the car instead. Like it's the same idea. And so I think that when we talk about collaboration, this, part is where we need to get things right yeah. and us speaking the same language, using the same standards, ensuring that all parties across the supply chain can understand each other is how you can start to identify the, the good players that you should be investigating or investing more um, resources into. Thank you so much, Joe. Yeah, I think you start seeing this term of like deforestation free or DCF, deforestation conversion free. Like, you, like before this, you might have been like, what is a deforestation-free fish? <laughs> um, but I think you're going to be seeing that more and more across different products, across leather. We're about to kick off, you know, a big project with a bunch of brands. So I really think it's looking out for that um, and, and supporting, you know, that aspect of, yeah. of your products. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, I'll just remind people that farmers are just farmers. They're not scientists. They do the wrong thing, not because they want to, but because they're pushed to the lowest common denominator. And that's price. So it's our responsibility to pay for the food that we get, for the retailers and chefs to demand that they do their job as the gatekeepers to allowing consumers, because it's very hard for consumers to even know. Could you imagine if you have to think to this kind of detail? I just do it for seafood and I still, don't know, I still don't know everything out there. On every food item, you know, it, it's almost near impossible. But we've seen some great movements. We did a responsible shrimp, shrimp project with Ocean in, from an Ecuadorian farmer all the way to Ocean French retailer. And Walmart just announced two days ago that they're going into deforestation free, conversion free seafood. So, I mean, it's coming, it's our retailers will do this job for us, and we need more of that. We've got to demand that those people in policy who are making sourcing choices are doing their job so that, let's, let's be honest, we can just enjoy our seafood and not have to worry about where it comes from yeah. and what it's been fed. Jason, I'm going to say yeah. something before you, you speak, yeah. because 
You and, and Mark Kaplan have been such leaders in this space, and I want to thank you for that. You have helped me understand traceability and transparency in so many different ways, and the power of data, and the, and the right data, and being able to use it effectively. So thank you for that work. Now you can answer the question. Oh, thank you. So, so something I've said in the past is that good brands, they avoid problem areas. Great brands actually engage in them. They invest in those problem areas. We need more great brands to take lead and invest in some of those challenging areas. The only way they can is to have traceability back to the individual farms. Yeah. They can't possibly do so if just they, they know there's material coming from a huge, you know, area-wide, who knows what. They need to be able to invest in those specific farms, yeah. which means we need traceability. And I, I think we're seeing more of this. And as those take lead, you'll find exactly what Vivian said, traceability will just be table stakes. And we can start to invest in other things and ways to use that data to better use our natural resources. So. I can't wait for that day. Thank you to all of the panelists. Please give them a big round of applause. Thank you, the audience, for ignoring that I introduced a panelist that actually couldn't be here and no one said anything. So thank you for that. <laughs> Give yourself a, a round of applause, audience. Thank you.